Hey everybody, today Rado runs through Viscounts of the West Kingdom, but before I get going, please turn your subtitles on to the Klingon channel so that when I make rules goose, you know what they are. And if you've done that, then welcome to the West Kingdom everybody, and say hello to the Viscounts! Oh, here they are, on their nice little horses. They are going to be zipping around the countryside, engaging in all sorts of Viscounty activities to earn lots and lots of points. I'm going to show you how it works today in a solo run-through, which is actually... 90% the same as a two-player run-through. It's just I'm playing against an AI that has their own specialized deck of cards that's going to determine what they're going to do. But they can basically do all the regular stuff that a human player can do, and they've got a board that's almost exactly the same as well. So you should get a pretty good idea of what this feels like for both a solo and a two-player run-through. So that's the situation. I've already set the game up, which means I have put these different wedges uh, randomly to create a kingdom, which has all kinds of opportunities, and it's all held together by this awesome little castle here in the center that also is full of opportunities. There are various townsfolk, villagers all over the place that we can use to our benefit to achieve various goals. There are a bunch of manuscripts waiting to be scribed if we decide to do that randomly. And as part of setup, each player is going to get a unique villager. Everybody has the exact same deck of, what is it? One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Uh, seven regular villagers plus one special one. And the way that works is there are a set of groups of car of special villagers and cards, and players will do a reverse draft to get them. Now, I already did that, and this was the special villager. I got Clovis here, who helps me recruit more people, and he uh, he's a little bit of a criminal there. So, they'll see how well he works out for me. And because he came with this card, I start with five coins, two stones, one debt, one deed, and I was also able to get rid of one of my starting cards. I thought that was weird that I said seven. Yeah, everybody normally starts with the same hand of eight cards. Uh, but I got rid of my abbot because when Clovis showed up, he killed somebody! And so the abbot uh, didn't make it, uh, which means I have fewer opportunities, because I got rid of this, to be able to do abbot type actions, which is do the manuscripts. So that's okay. That just means I've thinned my deck out a bit because this is a deck builder. I'm starting with these cards and um, I'm going to shuffle them up. And over the course of the game, I will be recruiting more of these folks to join my deck, and I might be getting rid of a few more of along the way as well. All right, so I've got my starting deck. The AI has their starting deck. I've got my starting resources, and after I've gotten them all, I flip this over as a nice little reminder of various and sundry things I might need to check every once in a while. And we are ready to go. I am the first player, and how does it work? Well, by default, I always have a hand of three cards. Although there are things you can do to increase your hand size over the course of the game, but right now I've got the Squire, the Financier, and Clovis! Hey Clovis! He showed up ready for work. Now I am, at the start of my turn, if I have any cards in my queue, any villagers, I slide them all over, which means the rightmost one leaves the board, and that might give me some type of benefit um, when they are retired from working for me. While they're still out here, they're doing stuff for me. And, but now at the beginning of the Game, I don't have anybody. So I skip that part. There's nobody to slide. Then, because I've slid everybody over and maybe somebody's come out, I put a new somebody in this slot. I take one of these three cards and I employ the Squire, the Financier, or the Clovis. And then I get to start going. So what do I want to do right off the bat? You know what? Hey, Clovis is my special guy. Let's get him to work right away. I'm going to put him out. Now, these are still in my hand. At the end of my turn, I'm going to refill my hand back up. So next turn, I might be doing the Squire or the Financier or whatever this card is. Who knows? I haven't seen yet. So I'll have to worry about them a little bit later. Okay, so when you put a card into play, there's a few things you do. First of all, this value up here means I am going to move three spaces around the countryside. And this is a rondelle of sorts. Actually, if you look closely, you can see, here's where I start, there's little arrows. So I could go one, two, three, or I could go one, two, three, because you can see there's that little arrow that lets me continue going this way or that way. So ultimately, I have to decide what area do I want to end in. And I must move three spaces, because that's what Clovis say. Alrighty, so where do I want to go? Well, um, let's see, I could come down one, 
two, three. So I could go there, here, here if I wanted to only end up in this space. But I also need to think about what am I going to do? Because depending on where I end, I have access to different things. If I end up in any of these outer spaces, I can either engage in different trade activities. You can see there's different ones in every space. Or I can build buildings. Um, if I end up on an inner space, then instead, I, I can't do trade or build buildings, which happens on the outskirts. When I'm in the inner kingdom, I can either try to work on these parchments, which like I said, I'm not very good at because I fired my abbot, or I can try to exert my influence in the castle. So I need to think about which of those four actions do I want to do? Alrighty. Although, you know what? Before I get to that, I've already forgotten something, folks. Before I start moving, but after I play Clovis, I have to pay attention to this nice little summary that everybody has on their board that reminds you what's going to happen. So, the first thing that happens every round is, like I said, stuff slides off and you potentially get some bonuses. Then a new card gets added. That's what Clovis did. And I forgot to check. Have I got any criminals in my employ? If I do, I get some corruption. And yeah, Clovis is not a good dude. He is a criminal. So because I've got some criminals in my employ right now, I in corruption equal to the sum total of all their criminality, which is one right now. If I, let's see, I do have somewhere in here, if my thief were out and then I played Clovis, I would get one two corruption because I'd have two criminals on the payroll. But as it is, it's just Clovis, so my corruption moves up one. I totally forgot about that. And now this is very important. My corruption climbing or my purity increasing will inevitably, sooner or later, these will clash and there will be a reckoning where I will determine what kind of rewards I get for my corruption and my... Uh, my uh, virtue is called. Uh, whether I'm going to be more virtuous when the collision happens or whether I'm going to be more corrupt when the collision happens and I get reckoned, that will um, trigger all kinds of stuff. But that's a ways off. I have gotten one more corruption because of Clovis. After that, then I move and then I do one of the four actions, which I was just talking about. Engage in trade or build if I'm on the outskirts, or um, exert my influence in the castle, or work on manuscripts if I'm on the inner circle. So now I got to come back over here and decide with my three movement, where am I going to go? Well, here's the deal, folks. Clovis has some skills. Well, first of all, oh, and more I forgot. Hey, when Clovis got put into play, he immediately gave me a benefit. That means this happens immediately. If this were a little X, what that would mean is his po power would happen when he slides off and we trigger the X action, but he triggers an action immediately. So I forgot something else. I get to immediately recruit somebody. Anybody, and it's free. Normally, I've got to spend one, two, or even three coins to recruit these people. And normally, I can only recruit where I am. But Clovis, he goes out there somewhere, and somehow, he gets somebody to join my um, followers. So I get to pick any of these. And which one am I going to do? Well, interestingly, since it's free, I'd probably want to take the one that's the most valuable, which would be this priest here, because normally it would cost me three to recruit the priest. Here's the problem, though. The priest makes me better at working on the manuscripts. And I already thinned my deck to say I'm less interested in manuscripts. So I don't know that I'm interested in the priest, actually. So, yeah, of the remaining ones... Well, the uh, this one, this one, and this one, they all cost one. So to me, that means they're a little bit weaker. The next most valuable is this miner. Normally, it would have cost me two coins to recruit him. So I think I'll go on ahead and take the miner, thereby revealing the patron, which is a, now somebody else who's available in the future. And now, whenever you get a townsfolk via any means, whether you use some special ability or you just hire them straight out, you get to do this action up here. This is saying whenever they are um, you know, employed or when they are hired, you do this action. My, this action is, hey, this miner, he's an okay fella. I am going to increase my virtue by one. So now my corruption is climbing and my virtue is climbing as well. All right. And... All right, so I am also going to... Well, actually, that's it for now. Uh, I'm going to put this in my discard pile, and later on, when this miner comes into play, my virtue will go up even more. Plus, as long as the miner's working for me, I'm better at building. But that'll come later. Right now, this goes into my discard pile. Okay, so that was it for Clovis. Clovis did a bunch of stuff. Gave me a free worker. Is going to let me move three spaces. He uh, offed the abbot when he showed up. 
And he's a criminal, too, which means my corruption. All right, so there's a lot of things happening. Now, back to the original question. Where am I going to move? Because I must move three steps. I th and here's the thing. As I was starting to say, Clovis is good at trade. And he's also good at criminality. And criminality is a wild card. So strictly speaking, having Clovis means I've got effectively two trade at points I can spend if I engage in trade right now. So that does make trade a uh, an interesting option for me because he's giving me one, two. Plus, you'll notice these two spaces don't have any people in them yet, um, which means they've got these open spaces. So there's two more trade. So strictly speaking, if I engaged in trade right now, I'd have one, two, three, four trade points that I could spend. Now, this space isn't filled either, which is giving me um, one point towards doing manuscripts, one point towards building, and one point towards exerting influence in the castle, sending workers of my followers to the castle. So um, that means if I want to do a castle action, I would have one, two castle points. Because again, a criminal can do anything. If I want to build, I've got one, two. But if I want to engage in trade, I've got one, two, three, four. So trade, I think, is a good option for me right now. So that means I probably, when I move around, I want to end up in one of these outer spaces because it's on the outer spaces that I engage in trade. I don't want to end up in the inner space. So then I got to figure out which space do I want to do. If I end up over here, I can use trade actions to get gold. Over here, I can use trade actions to get coins. Over here, I can use trade actions to get stone. Now I need stone if I want to build buildings. I need gold if I want to exert influence in the castle. I need coins. Just in general, I need them to hire people. And also, when I'm moving, remember, I'm going to move three. I could move more than three. I could go one, two, three. And if I wanted to keep going, I could spend a coin, one of my starting coins, and move four or five. If I have enough coins, I could move all the way around the board and end up where I started. Although, that'd be very expensive. So I got to ask myself, do I want to try to get gold for uh, castle actions, uh, stones for building, or coins for just hiring people in general. I think at this point, I would like some more coins. I d although, although, I did start with two stone. And I just hired a miner, which means I'm going to be better at building. So I think it's, I, but I think at this point, I want coins, especially because it's a coin for every trade action, whereas it's a stone for every two. So I'm going to get a better return here. So that means I need to end here. But remember, I must move at least three. So to do that, I'm going to go one, two, three. And I have arrived, instead of making over here. And now, I can do the action. Although, if I look back over here, there's a little bit more to it than that. Remember, I'm going to pick trade, building, uh, uh, scribing, or castling. But if I want, I can increase the va my ability to do that action by temporarily hiring the person in my location. And right over here, there's a priest. If I wanted, I could spend three coins right now to get this benefit and to get this benefit, which means I would be better at parchments. I'm not doing parchments right now. So I don't think there's any reason for me to spend three coins right now to help him make me do parchments when I'm not actually doing parchments. I would still get this bonus, but I don't care about that bonus. So I think I am not going to hire him or dismiss him, I think is the official term. That means I'm skipping this. This says, hey, you could hire somebody to help you do these actions. But either way, I'm going to do an action. I'm going to do a trade action. I could potentially try to do building here instead and build in this space or this space, but nope, I'm all about that trade. And remember, uh, if we look back over here, I have, because of Clovis, one, two, three, four trade actions. So, um, although, whenever I engage in trade, I can supplement that trade by spending coins. Although in this point, I'm doing trade to get coins, so I could spend coins to get more trade, which would get me more coins in return, so I'm not going to do that. But I am doing a trade action. I've got one, two, three, four. I'm not supplementing it with the uh, priest or with any of my other resources. And so I'm spending four trade actions to get four more coins. And I'm rich. One, two, three, four. I've got almost 10 bucks to my name now. I'm rich, I tells you, rich. And that was the core action I was going to do. I put somebody into play, checked if they were criminals. I then moved. 
And then I did one of the four actions. Now, as the turn continues, after I've done one of the four actions, I have the option of not temporarily. I remember before, I could have temporarily hired this priest just to get his, uh, his above actions here. Let me go ahead and turn them around. There's no other players, so you can just see him a little bit easier. So I could have hired him to get these bonus actions, but then he would have been gone. I would have removed the card from the game if I had paid him to help me with the action I was doing right now. I didn't. Um, I could now permanently hire him and put him in my discard pile if I wanted. If I wanted to have a priest who makes it easier for me to do parchments. Since I've already decided I am not about parchments this time I'm playing, I am not going to pay three of my coins to hire him. So, I am skipping that part. Now, at the end of my turn, I have to check, was there a collision? Have my corruption and virtue markers collided somewhere? Because if so, then I will um, you know, have to pay the penalty or get the benefit depending on where they collided. And all other players would be affected as well, interestingly. But, as it is, there's been no collision. And now the last thing I do is I refill my hand back up to three. I had two cards, I played Clovis, I draw a new card, and it is a lender. The next time, I'm going to slide Clovis over, play one of these new cards, move some, do an action, and so on. And that is the uh, crux of the game. That was one turn. Now, phew, that was a lot. Let's go on ahead and see what the AI is going to do. And unfortunately, the rules don't give the AI a name, so I'm just going to call the AI Gen. Now, they've got their own deck of cards, although these are special cards just for them. And as part of setting Gen up over here, there were certain things I had to do. Certain types of AI cards were removed. So I removed several cards, and this said what resources Jen started with. She started with three gold, one stone, one deed, one debt, and those cards out of her deck. Alrighty. And so... Like me, her turn is mostly the same. The first thing she does is she slides everything over, although she doesn't have anything right now. Then she draws a card and puts it in the first slot. And this card tells me what Jen is going to do. So, uh, this spot is empty, so nothing. Now this spot says, hey, um, hire the person with who is standing where you are currently. And uh, as part of setup, this is where they were standing from the get-go. So we're over here, and I, I'm saying hire, that is the wrong term. The official term is dismiss. Uh, when I was over here, I could have dismissed the priest to help me out. Jin is going to dismiss the architect to help her out. So uh, she takes this architect, and uh, she says, hey, I get the top right benefit. And now Jin, the AI, doesn't care about the top left benefit, because the AI never collects items or resources. They just do whatever it says on their card. So we're ignoring that. And uh, they get to do a reshuffle of cards, which is an interesting option. When I've got multiple people, get over there, Clovis. When I've got multiple people, I could move them around. I could rearrange them so that I could keep Clovis around longer. Or I could get rid of Clovis and I want to get rid of his criminality. So you can have control over who's in your queue. That's what this does. Now, for the, um, for the AI, for Jen, she doesn't care about rearranging her stuff. And so she's got this handy dandy little cheat sheet that is an at a glance reminder how she uses stuff that I would use. In this case, if ever Jen, the AI, were to get a uh, rearrange option or an action that would get her two coins, because she doesn't care about coins, instead, she just gets a resource of her choosing. She just takes her preferred resource. So. That means, first of all, she dismissed. Remember, I could have dismissed him to get help. J uh, Jen is dismissing this to get the rearrange, since she doesn't rearrange anything. And by the way, when a card is dismissed, they're gone. She just gets a, a card, a cube of her choice. And there's a reminder on her player aid here, on her player board, that above all else, she wants gold. If she has six gold, then she instead will take ink. If she has four ink, she'll take stone. So she just wants some gold. So, by dismissing somebody, she got some gold. Now, she is going to move three steps, and then she is going to try to uh, make a parchment. And if she can't make a parchment, she will get a resource of her choosing again and flip either a deed or a debt, which is a very common action players want to do a lot of as well. So, she's going to move three. One, two, three. And the AI, she always moves on the outskirts. She never moves to the inner ring. So, she has just moved over here. 
And now, she, if she could, if she could generate, what does she need here? Six scribe points. She would need six. Then she would make this parchment and get the benefit. But she cannot do. How much? How many scribe points does she have? Well, this card says she's got one. Over here it says she's got one. So she has a total of two right now. Two is not the six she needs. And with two, she couldn't. She couldn't even have done this one. So since she does, she did not generate enough scribe points to be able to make this manuscript. Instead, she is going to flip one of her deeds or debts, and she's going to get a resource of her choosing. And remember, her preferred resource is gold, so she's going to take another gold. Although she's getting to the point where she won't want gold anymore, and she'll start taking ink. But for now, she took a gold, and she's going to flip. Now. Um, flipping deeds and debts is a huge part of the game. Every debt you have is worth negative two points at the end of the game. But if you flip them, suddenly they're not, they don't lose you points and you get a resource of your choosing. And by the same token, if you have any deeds, uh, they're worth one point. But if you flip them, they become worth three points. So she is going to, and so it's always worthwhile to flip. And I also, by the way, as part of my setup, I have a deed and a debt. So I'm looking at negative one point. I'm losing two points for my debt. I'm getting one point for my deed. I would like to flip mine, but I'll have to find a way to do that. Uh, Jen, she's just going to go ahead and flip. And whenever she has multiple types to choose from, she chooses whatever she's flipped the least. In this case, where she has uh, an equal amount of deeds and debts, all by default, they always flip the debt. So... She got rid of her debt, and she gets another resource of her choosing, which, again, her favorite is gold. Okay. So, she did that. That was her turn. And again, it's kind of similar to mine. A card comes out, everything slides over, you move around the board, and then you do some actions. She can just do a bunch of actions, potentially. Okay, it is my turn again. And so, Clovis slides on over, making room, and eliminating these three helper icons, replacing them with his two helper icons, and I've got to play one of these characters. And now what do I want to do? The financier will give me two coins and will let me discard a card so I can get through my deck faster. The squire uh, will, won't do anything for me, but will help me exert influence in the castle. And the lender will, when she gets kicked out, when... She gets this, or comes all the way out the right side. That's what the little X means. She will let me flip one of my deeds or debts. And in the meantime, she will give me two trade actions. Whereas the financier will give me money, but only one trade action. I think with the cards I've got, I'm going to do a lot of early trade. Let's go on ahead and have the lender come into play. Okay. So now, is the card I just placed a criminal? No. So that means I don't suffer any more corruption, even though I do have a criminal. It's when a new criminal shows up that I would suffer some corruption. So we deal with that. Now we move. I'm going to move one space. Boop. Although if I want, I can move more by spending coins. But you know what? I'm happy to come here. So I've come to this space. And now, if I want, once again, I can dismiss the priest to get his help by spending three coins. Again, I don't want his help. If I'd moved further, I would have been able to get the help of the traveler. Oh, and that would be nice because the traveler, if he gives me help, he gives me two more trade actions, which is what I'm planning on doing right now. Because I've already got one, two, three, four, five, six trade actions. I'd have eight trade actions if I moved up one more. And remember, I, you know, this card said I move one, but I could spend a coin and move again. I could spend a coin and move even further if I wanted. Uh, so I've got to ask myself, do I want to use trade actions to not get the help of the priest and get some stone so I can build? Or do I want to spend a coin to move further so I can use trade actions to get gold? Gold is used for exerting your influence in the castle. So that's interesting. Oh, and by the way, um, I was over here. I didn't have to move this way. I could move down here. You can see there's a little arrow saying move this way, which means I could exert influence in the castle or try to work on this manuscript. The AI, they always stay on the outskirts, and from the outskirts, they can do inner and outer stuff. But as a human player, if I want to go to the castle, i got to go to the castle. I can't stay out in the building area. I think I would like to get to a point where I can build faster. I already have two, so I think I just want to get some more trade. Even though I'm giving up the chance to dismiss this guy by spending two coins to get two more trade actions, I'm happy to come here. All right, so I've come here. I am, once again, I'm not going to dismiss this priest to get his little temporary bonuses. Don't care about that. And now I'm going to engage in trade again. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, which means I can get three stone. But remember, all of these actions can be supplemented. Trade can be supplemented with coins. Building can be supplemented with stone. 
Uh, Castle Influence can be supplemented with gold, and Scribing can be supplemented with ink. I know I'm not using the correct terms, folks. I'm just thinking in terms of thematically what we're doing. We actually uh, do make parchments and stuff like that. But anyway, so I've got six total trade actions, which gives me three stones. But if I want, I could spend two more coins to get another stone. I think I will. So I've got six. That gets me three. One, two, three. So I've got five stone now, since I started with three. But I'm going to give up one, two, three, four more coins to convert those into additional trade actions. So I'm turning four coins into two more stones. Mm. Do I have a builder in my hand? No, I don't. All right. So, yeah, I'm getting two more stone. I'm, I'm turning some money into stone. So now I've got seven total, which is kind of a magic number. All righty. So I've done some more trade. And now if I want, once again... I can actually hire this priest. Once again, I don't care about him because he helps me do an action. I've decided I'm not going to focus on much. And then I check for collision. I still haven't had a collision yet. And then I refill my hand. I draw a new card. And it's my laborer. Oh, that's that's pretty nice. Okay, so this is going to be my starting hand for next round. My second round is over. I've, done, I've engaged in trade twice. Got a bunch of money and then converted that money into more stone so that next turn I can start building. And I think I'll use my handy dandy laborer to help with that building. But that's in my next round. It is now the AI's turn again. And so, like me, they're going to slide. A new card is going to come out. And it's this one. And it says, hey, first of all, get a resource of my choosing. And remember, their preferred resource is gold, unless they've already got six. They do have six, so instead they'll take their second preferred. Jen will get herself some ink which uh, she will potentially use later on. All right, so she's got one stone, one ink, and six gold. That was her first action. Her second action is move one space. And then her third action is if she can build. If she can't do that, then do her preferred action, which is exerting influence at the castle. And if she can't do that, because again, she doesn't have enough action points to do it, she will get a debt and then flip a, uh, uh, a, flip a deed. Right. So, all right, so this is what's going on. She is, she got herself her ink. She is moving one space. And now, can she build? All righty. How many build actions does she have? She has one and none and none. So she cannot build. She does not have uh, enough actions. Because to be able to build, you need at least three to build one of these little buildings. So she can't, she didn't generate enough actions to build. Can she do her preferred thing? Her preferred thing is exerting influence at the castle. Now, uh, as a reminder right here that you need at least three action points to move two of your workers into the castle. Does she have three uh, castle action points? She's closer. She's got one, two. But that is not enough, so she cannot do her preferred thing. So that means she's going to go to the third one. She's going to go on ahead and get herself... Her uh, another debt. She's already paid off one debt. Now she's got. Oh wait! 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 Hold. Oh, she can't. I forgot. Remember how? Remember how? Over on my turn, I supplemented my action with um, coins. She's got stuff. She can supplement her actions as well. She wants to build. She, that's her preferred thing. Remember, she had one build icon, which was not enough. Now, building can be supplemented with stone. She had one stone. So that means she's really got one, two. That's still not good enough. So she can't build. Her second choice is exerting influence in the castle. That she can do. Because she's got one, two of these little castle fleur de -lis, and she's got all the gold she needs to supplement. And she wants to pump as many workers into this castle as she can because this is an area control element. The more you have in here, the more points you're going to score at the end of the game and unlock all kinds of benefits. So, she, to be able to move two of her workers into the castle, there's like a nice little summary of it right there, she needs three um, uh, influence action points. If she has five, she can put three in the castle. If she has eight, she can put four in the castle. Now, she has one, two... Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. She has eight. She is going to spend all of her gold to put four, one, two, three, four workers into the castle. And now she's in this area, so she's going to put them in this area. Now, um, and remember, if she were a human player, she would have to be on the inner ring to do this, but the AI can do it on the outer ring. So she's going to put four because she had eight total action points. She spent all that gold she had. 
And now this uh, this functions for her the same way it does for any player. Uh, players can put um, one, three, five, or eight, and she can put uh, three, five, or eight. So she has, or I'm sorry, not one, three, five, or eight. Uh, can put um, one, two, three, or four. The AI can put two, three, or four. She has put four in here. Once you put them in, there is the opportunity for these workers to spread around. And the way that works is you evaluate all of the lower tier sections of the castle. And in any of these tiers where you've got three or more of your workers, they are going to spread out. As you can see, a gen has more than three. So whenever they spread out, one of them moves to the inner circle and two more of them move laterally. You can see these little arrows move laterally. So she is just spreading all of her influence out. And because this one has moved to the center, she gets a little bonus, which is paying off a debt or a deed. And uh, she still has this deed that she has not um, flipped yet, so she will flip it, turning one point into three points. This is one of the ways that you can pay your debts or upgrade your deeds is by working your way into the inner circle of the castle. So she did this action. She spent eight total. That was four. And now the whole process for spreading around the castle is you look around and see if, you, if any of your groups are three or more. And you know what? Jen might have, from a previous turn, already had two here. And so when she moved this over, all of a sudden, she would then have to resolve this area. And somebody would move up, get her a bonus, and then these ones would spread out. You can get some very... The more workers you have in the castle, you can get really big, almost pandemic-style explosions of workers moving all over the place and triggering all kinds of actions. Although in this case, since these were the first ones in, it was just one... Um, you know, man maneuver. Alrighty. So, there are no more groups of three in Jen's color, so we're done with that. Then you also have to check, are there any locations in the castle where there are four or more workers of any color? So, if I had previously somehow had, uh, you know, three, uh, you know, three workers over here, let let's say, um, not that that would be like, I probably would, but you know, this could have been something that happens. When Jen moved this in here, suddenly there are more than three and we have to reduce down to three. So, uh, somebody would end up losing a worker from the castle. Although when that happens, there are rewards to be had, depending on whether that person lost was in the outer, the middle, or the inner ring of the castle. Actually, the, you don't remove them from the inner ring. You remove them from the outer or the inner. Now, it doesn't matter. I didn't have any workers, so that didn't happen either. But this is all stuff that can happen when we're doing these big castle moves. So anyway, she moved. She did her castle thing, which means she did not get herself another debt and flip another card. So, she is done. That was her second turn. Alrighty. And this is definitely something a player may do in the first or second turn. Start getting people into the castle. Okay. It is my turn again. Everybody slides. Nobody has slid out yet, so I'm not triggering any slide out actions. And now I've got to put somebody else to work. If I put the financier in, I will get some money. I will get to discard a card either from my hand or from my draw pile, because if there's a person I really want to get really quick, I might want to discard cards to get to them faster. And she would increase my trade again. I could move three steps, or I must move at least three steps, and I could do an even bi another big trade. But I think I've done enough trading. I'm going to build. We are going to bring the laborer into play. Okay. So, once again, we check. Was that a criminal? No. So I don't take any corruption. Then uh, we move. I got to move at least two steps. And remember, I could go one, two, but since I'm planning on building, that's why I brought my laborer out. So as you can see, my laborer helps me build. I don't think I want to move to the inner ring. Um, yeah, it makes more sense for me. Although, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna I, I'm moving two. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stay on the outer. So that's one, two. That means I could build in this zone. Although if I wanted. I could spend coins to keep moving if I wanted to build in this zone or this zone. And now the zone I build in, well, I choose that in large part because I get different rewards for building on different spaces. I think I'm happy to build here because I can either give myself one gold or I can flip a deed or a debt. And remember, I want to flip these deeds and debts just as bad as Jen does. So I moved to, which it said to do. And now if I want, I could dismiss this traveler specifically to get two more trade bonuses, which happens to be the same color blue as my blue screen. Ignore that. So I could get two more trade bonuses, but I didn't come here to engage in trade. 
So I don't think it makes sense. I could pay two to get another purity, because that's the other thing the Traveler would do, would increase my purity, so I'm getting closer to a collision. But I'm not going to do either of those things. I'm going to save my money. So I'm skipping, dismissing, and now I'm going to do an action. And this time, I'm not doing trade. I am building. So I need to figure out how many build points do I have to spend. And that is one for my laborer, and then one more for good old Clovis, because a Clovis is a criminal, can do anything. So I've got two. But remember, in the same way that I supplemented trading with money, and that Jen supplemented castle actions with gold, I can supplement building actions with stone. And I got a bunch of stone. So I've got one, two, let's say, three, four, five, six, seven. And that leaves me two stone for more building in the future. I'm spending, um, what is this? Five plus two, that gives me seven total build action, which means I can build the biggest types of buildings. These ones cost seven. These ones cost five, and these ones cost three. So as you might imagine, I get a bigger reward if I build these big ones. So which one am I gonna build? Because once I build them, I unlock a permanent bonus. I could become better at building, better at castle manipulation, getting workers into the castle, or better at script scribing. I'm not going to build that one because I don't care so much about that. I think I want to keep on building because now my builder is in the queue for a while. And as long as he's here, I could keep on using his power to build, and this makes him better at building permanently. So I am building this building, which unlocks my my build increase. So I'm better at building in the future. And now I got, where am I going to put it? I can put it over here to give myself one gold, or I can put it over here to give myself one flip. I'm going to do that, which means I'm going to pay off my debt, which means I'm not losing two points and I get a resource of my choosing and I'm planning on building some more. So I'll give myself another stone. So now in the future, I've got one, two, three, four, five, with good old laborer dude here, I could build these uh, five point buildings in the future, which will come in handy. All right, so that was a big move. I did a bunch of stuff to build, um, thanks to the help of the laborer. And now, um, remember, at the end of my turn, wherever I am, whoever's here, if I want, I can spend money and recruit this person and they will go into my discard pile. And this tra I didn't want to recruit the priest. He and I was not interested in. I do like this traveler. So I'm going to spend two of my coins, and now I'm almost broke, and I'm going to recruit this traveler. And um, when I recruit him, I get some more purity, some more virtue. So I'm getting closer to unlocking a bonus for a uh, corruption and virtue collision. And uh, in the future, he'll let me move two spaces. He'll make me a better trader. And I can... Oh, this isn't as interesting. I can use trade tokens. I, I can use trade points to work better at scribe stuff. So this is interesting. I got rid of my abbot, my original scribe. But this is kind of a scribe that allows me to turn all my merchants into scribes. And I've got more merchants, including him. So yeah, this kind of, if I ever do decide to do scribes, because there's a lot of points and a lot of bonuses to be had for doing scribe actions. So I think I will. So basically, my traveler has upgraded my abbot, who uh, disappeared when I originally hired Clovis. Okay, so that was that. I did hire somebody. I checked to see if there's a collision. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting closer to a collision. And then I refill my hand, and I drew my trader. So, it, I might go back to more trades in the future. We will see. But that was that turn. And it is now Jen's turn again. Slides on over. A new AI card says, Hi, I would like to become a little bit more pure myself. Because Jen can also trigger... Oh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, I can't think of the word. Uh, virtue and corruption collisions. She does that. She's then going to move three. One, two, three. And now, if she can, she would like to exert influence in the castle again. If she can't do that, she'd like to do her favorite thing, which, coincidentally, is exerting influence. And if she can't do that, she's going to get a debt and do a flip. All righty. So, what... Uh, how, all right. So, oh, she has got one, two fleur de -lis, And she needs three. If she had three, if she had one more of them, or if she had some gold to supplement, then she could get some more workers into the castle. They'd come into this area and potentially start spreading and all that. But she's just a little short, so she can't do that. So she is going to give herself another debt, and then she is going to flip 
a deed, as you can see. Uh, and her problem is she doesn't have any deeds to flip. She only has one deed. It's already flipped. So she got her debt. She can't do this. And we have this little reminder over here that if she cannot do the flip she wants to do, or she would ever get the opportunity to discard cards, she doesn't care about discarding cards, or doing this action, instead she can't do that, she's going to get a second purity. She's getting closer to a collision herself. Alrighty. So that was her turn. Nice and easy peasy lemon squeezy. Okay, so we're back to me. And once again, we're going to slide. And very sadly, Clovis, who has served me so well with all his criminal enterprises, slides on out. And he does not have an action that happens when he slides out. So I just say goodbye to him. He's over in my discard pile. Very sad. I would like to see him again, even if he does increase my corruption. So what am I going to play? I have to admit, at this point, we're saying I want to do more building because I've got the stone and I've upgraded my stone. But I don't have any more builder cards. I need to go out and hire somebody. Like, say, none of these people. None of these people. Well, actually, no. The scoundrel produces crime, and that could help me build. And if I want to keep building, hmm. Well, I mean, these will help me with trade. And here's the I still have two trade, and my lender's about to disappear. So should I engage in more trade right now before she disappears? Because then my builder will be around, and I could... Yeah, okay, so I think we're going to do some more trade. So that means I want to bring out the trader or the financier. Let's bring out the financier. All righty. So, she's the new one, and she says, Hey, upon entry, get two coins. I don't mind that, because I was getting a little low. And, if I want to, I don't have to. I can discard either one of my cards from my draw pile, or my, my draw pile, or my hand. Now, here's the deal. This squire, I am not particularly interested in, in putting him to work anytime soon, because he's got the fleur-de-lis that lets me get into the castle. I'm not very good at that. Right now, I think I just want to stay on the outskirts and build. And, uh, I mean, eventually I'll probably want to get in here and exert my influence some. But right now, I think I'm just going to delete him, because then that means I'm down to one card. I'm going to draw two cards next round, because the sooner I go through my deck, the sooner I get my best friend Clovis back. So I am happy to just go on ahead and discard the Squire, get two coins, and now I'm going to move at least three steps. And where do I want to end up? If I'm going to do some trade, I've got one, two, three. Only three trade actions. But remember, I can pump up trade actions with money. Hmm. So if I end up over here, four trade actions would let me flip a deed or a debt, so I could turn one point into three points. That's pretty nice. If I make it over here, I can again turn trade actions into money. Yeah, let's just get some more money, honey. Let's go one, two, three. And I have one, two, three trade actions. One per one, I get three more coins. I'm just keeping the money. Oh, wait, oh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't think I'd want to do that. But if I wanted, remember, I could dismiss this. I'd pay three. That would help me with either castle or trade. And it would let me discard another card. No, that's not worth it. Because I'd be paying three bucks just to get one extra trade. That might be worth it if I was trying to get stone. But it doesn't make sense here. So I'm just going to get three. I did not have the patron help me. Didn't need your help. Thanks, but no thanks. Pat. All right. I didn't do the building, which is what I was getting ready to do. But I'll do it next turn. I just made a bunch of money. I'm happy about that. Now, they're going to ask, do I want to hire Pat? I think so. I will spend three bucks and continue building up my deck. Pat will give me gold um, in the future and will help me with trade and with exerting influence in the castle. And let's move three steps. And right now, because I just hired uh, Pat, they're just my best friend, I get to discard another card. So, let's see. I think... Oh, I've got, a, I've got another a criminal. I mean, the quicker I can get to Clovis, the better. I don't know if I want to discard it. You know what? I think I'm done with trade. I'm going to go and discard this trader as well. His power is, hey, I get plus one trade, and when I'm doing trades, I also make a buck every time I do trades, which is nice, but I'm doing okay for money. So I um, use the special power of the, my new patron, who I call Pat, to discard the trader. So at the end of my turn, I have no cards left in my hand. Uh, because I played one and then I discarded two. And I engaged in some trade and I'm getting ready to build. But now at the end of my turn, I have to refill back up to three. So I, um, I've got my draw pile. One, two. So I've got a thief and a journeyman. And now i got to reshuffle and draw. And there's an interesting thing that happens every time we end up having to reshuffle. 
which is mentioned right here on our handy down little player aid. So I've had to reshuffle. I'm drawing my third card. Is it Clovis? It's not Clovis. It's the guy I just got rid of. It's like a bad penny. But every time you reshuffle your deck, you have to take a quick look. Do you have any criminals currently employed? If you don't, get some virtue. If you do, get some corruption. As it stands right now, I have no criminals employed, so my virtue increases, and I'm getting ever closer to the all-important collision. Alrighty, and I got a traitor. It wasn't Clovis like I was hoping, but that's fine. I am done. Meanwhile, Jen slides on over, gets a new card coming out, and ooh, she has a criminal. Enterprise now. So this is a wild card that will ever do anything. And the uh, first thing she does is she checks to see if she has any criminals. She has one, so her corruption increases. Then she is going to increase her deck. You've seen I've done a little bit of deck building and getting more stuff. The AI has deck building as well. She gets one of her later more powerful cards added to her discard pile. So that's what that said. That'll show up later. Then she moves one step, boop. And then she does what she most wants to do. And the interesting thing is, um, in this game, she most wants to exert the castle, but if I had, this is the, here's the, uh, the, multi, the multiplayer side, here's the solo. If I had given her this one, the thing she'd want to do most is inking and scribing. If this one, the thing she'd want to do most is building. On the back side of this, the thing she'd want to do most is, um, oh, what do you call, messing with deeds and whatnot. So you get a different themed character every time you play solo that really kind of focuses on one thing. This character is focusing like a laser on that castle. So she gets down here. Can she do it? She needs to have at least three. She's got one, two, and since she has a criminal, she's got three. That is enough to put two of her workers. And now two wasn't enough to trigger an explosion or anything. So she's starting to get more um, you know, control over the castle. And she's getting ever closer to the center. All righty. So that was it. She did that. She is done. It's back to me. Back to my turn. And all right. Everybody slides on over. And we say goodbye to the lender. And the lender had an exit ability, which is... Oh, no! Oh. Oh, yes. Phew. Oh. Oh! Ugh, you know what? Here's the deal, folks. When I built this, I forgot to flip my deed. I'm kind of glad. I think I built over here and gave myself some gold. I could, I could have built in either of these two spots when I was in this area. Um, I think I took the gold instead of flipping because I knew when she was coming out, she was going to let me flip a deed. And if I didn't have any, that'd be really much of a bummer. So I used her ability when the lender came out to flip my deed and give me more land holdings, more points. Thank you. Now I got to play a new one. And... I want to build. I want to build. So let's go on ahead and get... Oh, will the thief be enough? I've got one, two, three, four, five. The thief would be six. Six does not is not enough to get me seven. But still, I could use the thief. And that means I would... Yeah, I'm going to use the thief anyway. Uh, this is one of my starter cards. She shows up. And uh, she means I'm going to move one space. She has one wild, and she's going to be around for a while. When she exits, she'll give me some money, and she'll get me a debt, which I'll then be able to hopefully flip and turn into resources later on. So anyway, so she's here. I got to check. Um, have I hired a thief? Yes. How many thieves do I have? One. My corruption is getting closer. We are about to collide. Worlds are colliding. And uh, now she says move one space, which puts me over here. And... Um, Although, remember, I could spend coins to move further if I want. And this time I am planning on building. Because I've got one, two, three, four, five, And I'll save a stone for later. So, do I want to build here, which would let me trash a card, removing one permanently from my deck, or flip something that I don't have? So, no, I do not want to build. I don't want to trash any of my cards. Nor do I want... I don't have anything to flip. So, I'm going to spend a coin to keep on walking, pal. Come over here. Which means if I build here, I could rearrange. So I could keep my laborer out longer so I could build more. Because he's about to leave. I think that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do that. All right, so I'm, I'm, I spent one come over here. I'm going to build. And right, I've got one for the criminal, two for the builder, three for my upgrade, four, five. That means I can build any of these. And which one do I want to build? Well, I get different things. If I build this, I can now move one extra space every round clockwise around the board. If I use this, I can, um, what do you call it? I can 
uh, get, dismiss people for only one buck, no matter how much money it says. So it makes it easier to dismiss people. If I do this, I get two permanent, so I'm better at trading. So that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, whichever one of those I want. Although, I just realized, remember, um, I've moved where I want to go. And if I want, I can dismiss the person where I'm at. And that means I would dismiss this scoundrel who um, would let me discard a card, would give me one criminal action, which is a wild. That means I could build one of the bigger, fancier buildings. I could build a level sevens. Interesting. I th uh, Although, if I don't dismiss her, I could hire her so I've got more thieves so I can really work on a high corruption strategy. I think... I think, 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 yeah. I am going to not hire her to get one more criminality so that I can get up to seven. I'm just going to leave her there, which means I um, have five to spend, and I am going to do... I really seem to be getting a lot of trade cards. And if I use this, I make myself better at trading. I will go on ahead and do this. I will put this... No, uh, no I'm not going to. I'm going to do the one that makes it easier to dismiss people in the future. They only cost one instead of three or whatever. So I built that. And because I've activated this, I get to rearrange stuff. I want my laborer to stick around longer. I'm not doing trade right now. So I'm fine to have my financier go away. So yeah, we'll go like that. Although, you know what? If I let my thief go away, then I'll make a buck and I'll get another debt. Because it would be really terrible to get a free opportunity to flip and not have anything to flip. The sooner my thief leaves, the sooner I can get some debt. So I've got a card to flip. Yeah, okay. So there we go. Although that means I can't build as much. But hey, I've got this building uh, to set. To, right, so I think that'll work. Okay. So I built here. That let me rearrange things. I'm pretty happy with that. And now... I decide I am going to spend one and I'm going to hire this scoundrel who lets me discard something right now. Er, I'll, di I'll discard this traitor again because I just want to get to Clovis. I want Clovis back. Alrighty. And uh, so I discarded him. Why did I discard him? I forget because I had something going on. Oh, because I hired the thief. Right? I, I hired the scoundrel who is going to start giving me ink, which I'm less excited about, but I am excited about getting more wild cards to be able to do everything a little bit better and kind of focusing more on corruption. All right. So that was my turn. We still didn't have a collision. We're very close to having a collision, folks. And we'll see. That might happen next turn. And now I refill my hand. I have one card, two, three, and no Clovis. Clovis is uh, feeling a bit shy right now. All righty. Jen's turn. Another one slides out. Slide on over. Her new card says, Hey, um, Jen is going to dismiss somebody. She's going to move two spaces, and then she's going to try and occupy the castle again because that's what she's all about. Alrighty, so uh, where is she? She's over here. She is going to dismiss this person. She doesn't care about this bonus, but she right now gets the opportunity to discard something. She doesn't care about discarding something. Anytime she would do that, she instead gets more purity. And uh, this is out of the game. So she got some purity off of that. And then she's going to move two spaces. One, two. And then she is going to try to see if she can castle it up again. And she can. She's got a fleur de lis, a fleur de lis, and a criminality. That's three. She has no gold. So with three, she can only put two workers in. So not quite enough to get an explosion to get to the second level. But now, if she gets some more over here, then these will come over here, and so she could get like a chain reaction of explosions later on. So she did that. Her turn was over, easy peasy. My turn, all right. Um, hey, I've got my miner and my miner and my laborer working together at the same time, you betcha. Okay, let's say goodbye to the thief. And upon exiting, the thief says, hey, I stole a little something for you. Um, although, I also racked up some debt for you too. So now I've got a card to flip. Although it's negative two points if I don't, I've got some coins. A new one comes out. And my my, my laborer and my miner together for the first time. Hey, gang, how's it going? And the miner says, hey, how about you get some purity? Boom. Folks, we've had a collision. Although the collision does not get resolved until the end of the round. So you're going to get to see a collision. That's why I was playing long enough until that happened. I knew it was going to happen eventually. So um, this is upon entry. He gave me some purity. And so now I have to move two or more spaces. Do I want to build some more? I think I've got one, two, three, 
four build actions. I've only got one stone. But three could let me build one of these little buildings, so let's do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. So how are I going to go? If I go one, two, then I can build in this spot, which will give me some more purity. Oh, I like that. Or a resource of my choice. Or if I just go one, two, I can come over here and get a stone um, for a later building, unfortunately, or an ink, which I don't want. Yeah, I'm just going to go here. I'm going to go one, two. Oh, this is interesting. If I go one, two, and then I spend some coins to go three, four, five, I could actually come over here and I could build in this area. And if I build here, since I've got both these buildings, I will get this bonus. But I'm not going to bother with that. Plus, whenever players end up in the same spot, that triggers a board collision, which does some stuff as well. But I'm just going to go one, two, because I'd like to build here. Because now that I've triggered my purity, I want to become more pure by building in that spot. So, I have one, two, three, four. Four is not enough to get to these buildings, so I'll just keep my stone and go with three, which means I can build one of these three buildings. Let me go on ahead and show you what they do. This one... Um, Makes It lets me move, become more pure when a collision happens. And I'm, I'm about to have a collision, so that will go into effect now. This increases my hand size from 3 to 4, so I've got more flexibility in the cards I can play. And this one says, every time that I retreat, or I get a new card and put it in my discard pile, I can also discard another card so I can go through my deck faster. It gives me more deck control. I think since I'm about... To, I, I'm going to resolve this collision right now. Having some more purity would be nice. So I'm going to build this building. And I'm going to put it in this spot, which gives me one more purity. And now that they've collided, they move into they move together. So both of them move over here. I just got a little bit more purity. All righty. And I built that. So now I've done that. Ah, uh, do I want to hire this deacon? No, again, I'm not. I'm choosing not to focus on the parchment stuff, which I'm sorry you haven't seen any parchment action yet. I figured the AI would do one eventually, but he's just been too busy working on the, the castle. He's really focused. I'll talk about those in a bit. But anyway, so I'm not going to hire this deacon, um, which means now we resolve the collision. It says, hey, when you're resolving a collision, get one more purity, which means I have successfully moved to peak purity. Hooray! I am super pure, which is very nice. Okay, so... Here's what's going to happen. Let's zoom in on it again so you can get a better look. I do everything on the top. And in this case, I only get one buck. So it's too busy being a goody two-shoes. But I get three deeds, which is three points. One, two, three. Although if I flip these over time, they'll go from three points to nine points. So I got the big payday. And really, in this game, you want to either be peak purity or peak corruption. Because either way, you get a bunch of cards that you'll be able to flip later on, and flipping is a big part, and you won't get much money or you'll get a lot of money. You'll get more points or more money and more opportunity to get resources. And since I was peak purity, I was all the way over here. That's what I got. Now everybody else has to resolve, do you have any criminals right now? Because I was, since I was pure, the uh, powers of the BC, well, is anybody a criminal? And, wouldn't you know, Jen is a criminal. She's got a criminal out. And this would affect all players. And so everybody who has one or more criminal in their employ at that moment gets a debt card. So Jen just lost two points. Although, remember, she has the chance to flip this and convert it into a resource. So Jen got a debt. Now, after all that was done, these split up and um, the balance between good and evil in my soul starts being reckoned all over again. Sooner or later, we'll have another collision, etc., etc. Although, my collisions, because I've unlocked this power, are going to tend towards the pure side a little bit. So, we had that. Jen's about to have a collision pretty soon, but hers still have got a little ways to go. And now, i got to refill my hand, which means I draw. And it's the Squire. Man, don't care for that. Alrighty, and that's crazy. Even though I'm, I'm re recruiting all these rogues and criminals, somehow I've tricked the populace into thinking I'm the most pure around because I got all those deeds. And that was that. That was my turn. It's Jen's turn. We slide on over. A new one comes out. And it's another criminal for her. And she's going to have a collision. Because there's a criminal, she has two criminals. Boom, boom. We are going to resolve. Um, and this is going to affect me at the end of her turn. She needs to get another debt. Another debt. She needs to move four spaces. One, two, three, four. And she needs to do her favorite thing, which again is castle. She can do it. One, two, three. Again, because of all this crime, means she can get two more workers. And boom, that was enough 
to trigger another explosion. So slide on over, slide on over, jump on up, and she gets to do another flip and says, do whatever you've done the fewest flips on. She's done a flip on both. So, um, well, actually, the only thing she could flip is more of these deaths. So she gets a resource of her choosing. Her favorite resource is gold. So now she's uh, building up for that. And she, uh, right, so there we go. And now at the end of the game, every one of these workers is worth a point at the end of the game. So Jen is building up a lot of points. Plus, if you can ever get enough workers to have an explosion on the middle to go into the center, you get a resource of your choosing, and you get this, which is worth five points at the end of the game, and it increases your hand size. Although the AI does not care about that. If she ever gets this, or if a human player gets this, somebody else can um, take it away from them if they get more people into the inner circle. And that's definitely something that is um, you know, tussled for if you've got multiple people trying to maneuver in the castle. And so Jen's close to getting another explosion all over the place. She could really start filling this castle up like nobody's business. Plus, now she's better at it because she's got some excess gold because she finally got a resource of her choosing. So that was it for her. It is my turn. And um, I think, folks, that should give you a pretty good idea. The only thing that hasn't happened so far, which is just crazy, is um, I haven't done... Let's just say... I, pl I had some characters who were good at inking, and I had some ink, and I moved over here. I went one, two, and say I wanted to do a manuscript. The way that would work is, like every other action, I would tally up all of my little cross icons I've got, which right now is none. That's a builder, that's a builder, that's a trader. But say these were both crosses, and, um, and if, say, I had some ink, right? Say I had two ink, and I had a criminal and a person. That would mean I'd have four, because I'd spend the ink. I'd have a criminal, that's a wild, and I have my good old priest, who I uh, said goodbye to earlier. Say I had four, that means I would need four to do this. I would claim this. This would immediately give me a bonus of one purity and trashing a card to tighten my deck up. And I would save it. These are really these are the simplest things to do in the game. You just have to show you've got the uh, the appropriate amount of of uh, action points for it uh, wherever you are. This one needs seven action points, but it lets you put four workers in the castle immediately. So that's a pretty big deal. So these are really simple. There's a set collection element to them though, which we are reminded of on our handy nanny little cheat sheet. Um, if you get a set of unique colors, because they come in four different colors, here's a black one, you can get one, four, nine, or 16 points. Um, plus, if you are the first player to get three of the same color, so if I did this and I got a black banner, then you better believe I would want to do this one because it's also a black banner, and then I'd want to find another one because once I've done three black banners, I get this, which is worth three points and makes me permanently better at continuing to do scribe actions. Whereas if I did three yellow uh, parchments, I, it's worth three points. It makes me better at castle actions, etc., etc. So that's how those work. And it just so happens in this game, neither of us had the workers that really pushed us towards a scribe action. But most of your points, you can have huge set collection modes. You can have huge amounts of points from here. You can have huge amounts of points because the more of a given type of building you build, the more points you get. If I build only one of these little buildings, it's two. If I build all three, it's nine. If I build only one of these big buildings, it's six. If I build all three, it's 21. So you're getting points for all of these actions. Um, but finding out the best ones for your strategy is the trick in the Viscounts of the West Kingdom. And now, if you'd like to hear some final thoughts, you can hit that I in the top right corner screen or follow the show notes in five, four, three, two, one.